Thank you, uh, Jorge, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for coming this evening, and um, I'm glad that it's a, uh, a large crowd. Um, we're hoping to shed some light and answer, ask some questions and answer some questions about the city's affordability uh, crisis, which I think is an appropriate word. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to very briefly uh, explain how this book, um, uh, The uh, House Divided, came into existence, and then uh, Three of my co-edit, the three co-editors, uh, Alex, Cheryl, and um, Annabelle, are going to talk a little bit about uh, their respective areas, and then we're going to. Uh, we're very privileged to have Councillor Anna Bailau uh, with us, um, and she's really at the very center of the housing debates that are taking place at City Council. And so we're going to ask her to talk a little bit about, you know, what are the kind of policy balls that are in the air at the moment. And uh, we also encourage questions. And uh, this is, you know, this was conceived as partly a book event, but partly an opportunity for, you know, members of the public who all of us are affected by the housing crisis to engage and to ask us or to ask Councillor Bailau about you know some of the you know some of the pressing questions that everybody has about what's going on. So uh, very briefly, the way this book came about, um, uh, I was at an event with uh, Annabelle and uh, and her partner um, Jane Farrow, and, and Annabelle was talking about and um, uh, a traveling exhibit of the housing system in Vienna. And Vienna, uh, Vienna, if, for those of you who don't know it, um, has a quite unusual kind of affordable housing model, which goes back to the early 1920s um, when uh, radical left-wing municipal government took power and created a, a huge amount of uh, public housing um, on publicly owned land in large and quite distinctive looking buildings um, to address like a significant housing uh, uh, housing crisis in that city. There were a lot of people working in the city and manufacturing, um, but there was very substandard housing. And what's interesting is that the Vienna model has survived through uh, through Weimar, through the Second World War, through post-war socialism, through the post-Cold War period. And today, um, I think the, the average amount that uh, uh, someone in Vienna pays for their housing is about 3% of their income, which is staggering. And this is because of a complicated system of subsidies, but also of public ownership of rental housing. And, um, and it's, you know, it's in, you know, it's a capitalist social democracy, and it presents this remarkable alternative. Um, so this is the kind of the genesis of this, was this traveling exhibit about, about the v Vienna model. And we started talking about whether it's possible to do some kind of event or some kind of handbook, a citizen's guide on dealing with the housing crisis, you know, to equip people with some, you know, key facts about housing policy. And one thing led to another, and we ended up doing uh, this book, which is an anthology. And the book um, tries to kind of peel the onion about what the sources of the affordability crisis are. And um, looking at, um, trying to answer some questions such as, there are older neighborhoods in the city of Toronto, which have these kind of low-rise apartment buildings and, uh, you know, triplexes and fourplexes and sixplexes that make great housing and they're, you know, they're close to the ground, they don't feel industrial in scale, and yet we don't build those anymore. And we were trying to, we asked ourselves, well, why is that? What's, you know, what's the missing part of that equation? And so the book tries to kind of get at that history, get, you know, get at the roots of Toronto NIMBYism, um, and then look at, you know, the current environment, why we have the situation that we have today. And then the final part of the book is, is kind of saying, well, these are some interesting ideas from different places, and what can we learn from those? Um, you know, what can we learn from Vancouver? What can we learn from Vienna? And all of these other places that have kind of tackled the housing affordability issues, which accrue to successful cities. And this is an important point to note. Toronto is a su successful city. A lot of people come here. They want to you know, build their futures here. There's demand for housing, and that is one of the reasons that housing prices go up, but there are other reasons, and so we're trying to kind of explore that. So I'm going to stop talking now and give it over to my uh, co-editors. I'm going to take it in alphabetical order. They'll tell you a little bit about their parts of the book, and then we're going to listen to Councillor Bylaw. So I'll start with Alex. Hi. There we go. Thanks for your patience. Um, yeah, I am Alex, and I'm proud to be one of the co-editors 
of this volume. Um, I want to talk about a couple of different things because I have a few different pieces in the book that touch on various issues, but there is a common theme, um, which I think is an important one in all of the issues that I chose to write about, write about and that is density. Uh, density not as a bad thing, as we often about it as something to be avoided or mitigated, but density as a good thing. So I want to take us back to uh, look at the old city of Toronto as it was before amalgamation. And the population of that old city was at its high point um, about 700,000. And that was in 1972. Interesting fact I found out while working on this book is that it didn't, it was dropping. Point. Sorry, this mic is, should we use another mic? Is it just gated? Is it me? How's that? A little better? Okay. I'll just try and speak more clearly. Sorry. Um, so the population of the old city of Toronto was dropping steadily from 1972 um, for a couple of decades before it started to rise again. And it didn't get back up to where it was until roughly 2010. So there were actually fewer people in the old city of Toronto even 15 years ago than there were 50 years ago at the high point. And I think that's a remarkable fact, and it also underpins a lot of the discussions we're having in the city today. Discussions about the so-called unprecedented growth that Toronto is experiencing, um, and the so-called impacts that that is putting on the city. The fact is that most of what has made Toronto successful, uh, most of the public goods that have made Toronto successful are a direct result of the density, the crowdedness, of that old city. I tried to unpack this in my own neighborhood to see what this looked like. Um, you know, my, I live just off Christie Street, you know, north of Bloor, um, you know, in what was a fairly modest neighborhood once upon a time. Um, and that neighborhood had roughly 9,000 people at its high point. It's down to about 5,500 now, um, which is an extraordinary drop. And it was at the high point when the neighborhood was crowded that all of the things that I rely upon um, as a resident and as a parent um, really came into being. Um, the public schools, uh, there were three of them built between 1950 and 1975, new parks. The city um, expropriated and tore down people's houses to build a park and a community center. Um, they built a waiting pool in the park, which my kids loved, which was one of 50 that were constructed in one year in the 1950s. You had, in short, um, a period in the city of Toronto where you had a lot of people living close together, um, which allowed the city to create a lot of public goods, which we still rely upon, and where there was a demand for a certain kind of public life um, and for the amenities that provide and allow for public life. Um, in, many of in many ways, the things that we are talking about today um, in trying to create new facilities and new amenities to manage all of this you know, intense growth that we seem to be getting you know, mirror exactly the conversations we were having 50 years ago. And the answer at that point was that we, were, we had the political will to create, to make the place better, and to create what the residents wanted because there were so many of us. One other thing that I think is important here looking forward, um, and this is the subject of my um, conclusion essay in the book, is to think about all of this in terms of climate. Um, and here, too, um, another public policy objective lines up very nicely with the idea of bringing more people closer together. Um, I did. The city of Toronto has got some new updated statistics on this in connection with the Transform TO plan, um, which just came out a couple of weeks ago, and they are staggering. The majority of Toronto's carbon emissions come from private vehicles and from private homes. And the concentration of carbon emissions, basically the further out you go from the center, the less densely people live, the more likely they are to drive, and the longer they are likely to drive their cars in commuting. All of those relationships are more or less linear. And the carbon footprint of the post-war parts of the city you know, are dramatically higher, multiple higher than they are in the old city. So, you know, this is not unique to Toronto by any means, but the fact is if we want to achieve a lower carbon city, as we now as a city say we do, you know, an, uh, one ingredient to that, and the crucial ingredient to that I think, is gonna be, again, allowing more people to live in neighborhoods that we have today, where it is possible to walk to things, where, um, as I believe this is becoming a policy objective, that you can have, is it a 15 minute city? Is that what's popping up in the, yeah. A 15 minute city, where everything you need is you know, within a 15 minute walk of your house. Vancouver now has a similar objective where it's a 20 minute city, um, and that's something that they are you know, committed to. And the fact is that 
if we're going to achieve that, if you're going to achieve a city in which many people have what I enjoy, which is all of the amenities you need day to day within a short walk of your house um, or b of your apartment, um, that's going to need more of us to live closer together than we do. And a lot more people to live in those older neighborhoods that, you know, to so many of us define the city and make it a great place. Um, because ultimately it's going to be more people living in those places that allows us to build the city that we say we want. Um, and we're gonna get there by building on the city that we built together 50 and 60 years ago. Hi, everybody. So my name is Cheryl Case. Um, I guess you guys got an introduction already. But uh, what I wrote about in uh, one of my chapters is uh, looking specifically at the relationship between um, how cities and how Toronto was planned and actually the social conversation around the role of women. Um, in my practice, that's really what I, I drive um, my, pr my work around is making a connection between our social society and our built form and the housing that you know is a product of the social conversations and the social dynamics that are at play. Um, so, to go and give a quick synopsis of what I what I wrote about is it takes you through a hundred year uh, journey looking at the first uh, building permit filed in the city of Toronto to build a a duplex, a small apartment building, and um, the response to this in 19. 03 was to say that an apartment building will lead to women no longer having care in homekeeping or in raising a family. This is, gives you an idea of the kind of conversation that was taking place at that time. Um, and so you jump forward uh, 50, 60 years, and women who work are considered career girls. Grown women are girls and not working women, members of society. Um, so these are the things that actually shaped the city, so when you think about the city of Toronto, um, the majority of it, of the residential land is actually zoned predominantly for single detached housing or uh, to accommodate that housing style and to not uh, create any kind of difference, to, 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 to minimize any difference in housing type. Um, so those who live, for example, uh, who live, those of you who live in the downtown, I'm sure many of you um, perhaps live in housing that actually has, has been carved up into many apartment houses. Um, I myself has visited a number of them. Um, those types of uh, changes didn't happen quite as often in the inner suburbs, um, where actually the most land of Toronto is taken up in the inner suburbs. Um, so yeah, so that's really what I, I hope to encourage you guys to do when you think about the housing crisis that we're in. It's uh, what were the conversations that were taking place at the time? Was the role of women and was the um, agency of women respected? And even now thinking about uh, other, uh, other minority groups and other marginalized groups, are people of color respected? Are they given fair wages? Are they given fair opportunity? Therefore, um, when they are not, they don't have access to um, adequate housing, their ideas on what is adequate and what is appropriate and obtainable for them is not reflected in policy. So, um, so that's, that's my approach um, on this conversation. Okay, and I guess I'm last because my name starts with V. I always hated that in school. Um, so, as John mentioned, uh, when we started talking about this book, one of the things that uh, I've spent half my life in Toronto, half my life in Vancouver. So when I moved back to Toronto in 2013, everybody was telling me how insane housing prices were in Toronto. And I just looked at people and thought, you guys don't know insanity. And, uh, and so, you know, for me, I've always been very interested in the mechanics of the market and the impact of uh, planning and architecture and design and politics on the issue. And that's really what I sort of looked at. But I just wanted to just sort of pick apart a couple of things that we did in the book. We sort of, we looked at, um, we contextualized the problem and looked at what had been built. We um, kind of unpacked the policy pieces right now that we see as impediments. And then we looked at future solutions. And that was largely what I'd done, is looked at solutions. But there, so the book is divided into three sections, and each section's uh, got a great photo. And this photo 
amazes me. I found it one day in the archive, and it's a, it's a couple in 1930s standing in front of a bungalow, and there's a sign that says, this bungalow built in one day by A.E. LePage. And I thought back to Vancouver and how houses sell in two hours and thought about the flip in that uh, expectation. This is needs-driven housing. And what hap what's happened in the global market in housing, in, in cities where the global market is running rampant, is it's market-driven housing. And the thing about these two things is, so there are all sorts of interesting facts that come out of this book. And one of the things that I think is just mind-blowing that um, John Van Nostrand talks about in the book is that before 1960, 60% 60 of all housing was owner-built. So you think about that statistic, and you think about your grandparents and your aunts and uncles who built their houses, and they built their houses to meet their needs. They had three kids, they built a house with three bedrooms. They needed a lodger, they built an extra bedroom. They needed a mortgage helper, they built a basement flat. So that was a needs-driven market. I have a need, I build a house. <laughs> then there's a, a switch in city regulation and planning comes into place and begins to regulate what happens. And so there's a switch and we begin to get planned communities and that's a whole other conversation. But right now what we are sort of faced with is that we, planning is really good at, at defining a single family house, which is a misnomer. And the market is really good at building condominiums, towers, what I like to refer to as pork bellies in the sky. And it's a market-driven investment property. It provides supply, of course. It provides housing, of course, that people are adapting to as the, um, the study that came out of... Uh, families in the condos, where families are adapting, you know, it looked at how families are adapting one bedroom condominiums into housing for their, their growing families because they can't afford to live anywhere else and how they're turning bathtubs into, into stroller storage and all of these innovative things are happening. So we sort of have this, these two polar opposites, a single family house or the condo. And what interests me is the diversity of housing stock that we've stopped building and that we fight at all costs. And this is the part for me that I think is a real lost opportunity. Toronto has, um, the statistic that we have in the book is that 200 square kilometers, the area within the city of Toronto is zoned exclusively for single detached family homes. That's all you're allowed to build. If you want to build a single family house, you can go to the to city hall with your plans tomorrow and you'll get approved if it fits within the zoning envelope. If you want to build anything else in those areas, you will fight tooth and nail. You will end up at a community council you will get neighborhood wars, you will have people screaming at you, you know, and so what it's created is that in, these, in this zone, and that, what we call, what's been defined by, as the yellow belt by Gil, Jill Mes Gil Meslin, represents 87 square kilometers, the area of Manhattan. It's quite a large swath of our city that's kind of landlocked by this, this old idea. And right now, a thousand square foot bungalows, which are the typical house that was built out in these areas, are now being replaced by 3,500 square foot mansions. They are not character, if we want to define character. They are not, it's not stable, which is another peculiar word in, the, in, in planning parlance that is kind of, I don't know anything in a city that's stable. It's, that's another oxymoron. A city is nothing if it isn't change. Um, so we try to unpack all of these things. And one of the things that is, you know, as Alex mentioned, is that in these houses, those thousand square foot houses out in North York, Scarborough, East York, Etobicoke, 
used to house an average of six people, two, two adults and four kids. Now those 3,500 square foot houses hold 2.25 people. And people wonder why their schools are closing, their libraries are shutting down, they can't keep their community centers open, and their high streets are dying. They don't have the population that they need to keep these things alive. And yet we continue, the market continues to intensify this tiny little edge of the city. And then we have these weird nodes that, you know, we've all seen them. You drive out to, you know, Scarborough and all of a sudden there's this cluster of towers. And this intensity of density that's landing in, in our neighborhoods and putting incredible pressure on all of these things. So I looked at other cities to look at what they're doing, and there's some really fascinating examples. And I think the thing that's really fa fascinating is that, you know, we all love the city of Toronto. We, we glow, go on and on and on about these beautiful neighborhoods. Well, those beautiful neighborhoods have every single type of housing you could possibly imagine. They have three-story walk-ups. They have apartment buildings. They have three, you know, houses with laneway houses. They have everything under the sun. And the world doesn't stop turning. We have houses where there are, you know, rooming houses that have multiple ten people who have to come together to afford to live in the city, all of these things. And why we can't create that richness of tapestry of possibility of living potential out in this yellow belt, where we have already invested money for schools, tax dollars for schools, tax dollars for roads, tax dollars for community centers. We've already made that investment and we're, we're letting it be mismanaged and those schools are shuttering and being sold off and people are fighting that. So Seattle has done a really interesting thing. They've gotten rid of their single family zoning because it is a misnomer. There is no neighborhood in their city that actually is a single family residential zone. And they've just called it residential. And now they're going back retroactively and they're writing zoning bylaws around typologies that exist in the neighborhood. So if there's a three story walk up in your neighborhood, they're writing a zoning bylaw that allows you to do that outright. If there's a four story apartment building that doesn't have an elevator, they're writing a zoning bylaw that lets you do that. So it's a very interesting proactive way to do it. And that's basically what I looked at. And I looked at Vienna, I looked at Edmonton, I looked at um, Vancouver and uh, unpacked those sort of places that are taking it on and trying to do it. Because I think that Toronto, if we take 10 years to unpack this piece of the puzzle, like we took to OK Laneway Housing, a typology that exists in the city and has existed in the city since day one. And it took us 10 years to go, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Similar to the basement apartment, you know, overnight they were made legal, they were made legal as if they hadn't existed before, right? So it's, it's an interesting way to think about it, what the political will is, where those levers are in the city to try and get this moving. I don't believe that it will create affordability because the market has, that's a whole other discussion, but what I do think it will do is it will increase the diversity of housing stock and that will give people more options. And when people have more options and they can build needs-driven housing, we get a richer city. I'd like to uh, uh, welcome Councillor Bailao again. And uh, so uh, maybe you could explain, there's a lot of housing policy that's in play at the moment. Housing Now, the, the motion that you and the mayor uh, uh, put to council a couple months ago. So if you could just sort of maybe go through what, you know, what are you guys talking about and what are the, what are the implications for uh, people who are living in Toronto neighborhoods? Well, um, we are actually creating the next 10-year housing plan, which is actually going to come forward uh, in the next couple of months. And so uh, what we're trying to create is a policy that a 
touches on all the aspects of the housing spectrum. And if you can see like a big line with big, lots of red flashing lights, that's our housing spectrum right now. From the shelter system all the way to market housing, we have issues in all these, these aspects. And so we've been working, uh, we've been building uh, more shelter beds than uh, we've ever had, and we've never had the situation that we have right now. Shelters are basically at, at capacity, and obviously there, there has been a huge disinvestment on the prevention side uh, that we believe has a huge impact on that as well. Um, and obviously the lack of housing has a huge impact on that as well. Um, we've, uh, we've been investing in supportive housing, which is another big, big uh, uh, and important need that we have. Um, we wish other orders of government, in particular the provincial government, was much more present. Uh, we cannot do supportive housing as, as uh, a city alone. We need, this is a health issue, and it needs to be seen as that as well. And then we start moving into the social housing, and we had, and we have, uh, a big issue with uh, the stock of social housing, because we were starting to lose the housing stock that we had that we hadn't we haven't built any for decades and we were starting to lose that we had a backlog we have a backlog of 2.6 billion dollars it's finally starting to get tackled i mean this year alone the city is investing more than 300 million dollars federal government made big commitment of 1.3 billion dollars to make sure that we're able to tackle and not close units but continue to have those units um available in the city of Toronto. We have about 90,000 units, 58,000 are uh, Toronto community housing, and then there's the, uh, the other 30,000 that are um, uh, managed and owned by about 200 nonprofit housing providers in our city. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the social housing, and uh, a lot of the people, when we talk about all these uh, um, uh, housing issues, tell us, well, but that's, that's not gonna solve some of the issues that actually people need that are in need of social housing, and it's true. We're seeing more and more uh, the need for also the social housing, uh, and some of these programs that we talk about and that I will continue to say that the city is investing uh, doesn't create that level of affordability. I, I'm gonna put it out there that we need to start pushing a lot more this issue, not only as a housing issue, but as an income issue, because the way that the market is, you're not gonna solve these issues for somebody that can only afford 200 or $300 of rent. This is an issue. Our OW, ODSP has not increased for a long time and we need to start addressing this and we need to start pushing the provincial government that this is also an income issue as well and it's not only housing policies, it's income policies that need to be uh, dealt with to, to deal with this issue. And then we start having with the what some people sometimes call the workforce housing and affordable housing, which is becoming a big, big issue in our city. And uh, very often we hear people saying, I cannot afford to live in the area of the city that I was raised. I cannot, I would not be able to buy my house today. Uh, we're hearing companies, we're hearing, you know, some of our people that, that manage shelters saying, we cannot find workers because they cannot afford to live in our city. And this is a big social and a big economic issue for the health of our city. We pride ourselves and we brag about the fact that we're attracting more investment, we're attracting all these jobs to our city. This is not gonna continue if people cannot afford to live in the city. Um, and so if we wanna continue to do this, it is very important that we're able to create that workforce housing. And that's what a lot of initiatives um, that we've been putting out there uh, has been, it will be creating this housing. So we have housing now. I mean, there's the first four sites of housing now, it's a, which is a program that is actually gonna be putting public land uh, available to create uh, housing. They're about, the first four sites are about to, to to go out in the market. Three of them uh, will be um, open, and one is specifically for the nonprofit sector. Could you, uh, could you say how many uh, So this. Put? This will create about 3,000 units um, and uh, almost 1,926, 56, something like that, of affordable, of affordable units. Um, the idea is to uh, increase rental stock and then create some affordable housing. Some of these sites are very, very large, and so there was a, an effort to create mixed-income communities uh, and to uh, 
bring rental uh, as well. So these will have uh, some affordable units. Um, they will have a percentage of deep, deeper affordability, uh, obviously not even close to what the city needs, but, but there is some level of deeper affordability and then there's everything from 60% to uh, 80%. But the average has to be at at least 80% of AMR. Um, we have the open door program. Just uh, uh, this uh, last uh, 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 council meeting, we approved another 650 units. This is a program that gives incentives to profit and non-profit organizations to, to build affordable housing through development charges waivers, through property taxes waivers, and so on. Uh, but again, this is going to target uh, very much the, um, the 80% uh, average market rent. And when we talk about average market rent, and this is one of the things as we are doing the consultations for the housing plan, people really asked us to, instead of having a definition of affordable housing that is guided through uh, market driven, uh, that we actually move into an income based definition of affordable housing. So the city is actually looking into that. How can we create an income based uh, definition of affordable housing? Um, and uh, obviously then- Sorry, could you just say what the current definition of affordable housing the city so uses? So it depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other problem. So if you go to the, the official plan is one, and then if you go to programs through CMHC is one, and then you know Open Door is one. But when we talk about average market rent, is the average of the market rents in the city, which is not the asking rent. So, for example, if you go out and you rent a one bedroom, I think the average now that the asking rent is about sixteen hundred, seventeen hundred dollars, something like that. If the the average market rent CMHC average for uh, the city, uh, I think it's about eleven hundred. So. Um, so when you're creating units at about 80%, so for a one bedroom, you'd probably get a 850, 950. That's that's what you what you get uh, for the the average market rent. So these are, uh, like I said, uh, created for affordable uh, the workforce housing. And what we're hoping as well is because we are ha having a national housing strategy, that it's going to have a very strong housing benefit uh, program that we expect that is going to be a, 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 be affecting a, over 30,000 Torontonians, that that housing benefit could actually be um, uh, awarded to some, some of the people that uh, will be able to get to these units, and that's how you will eventually get deeper affordability. And the reason this needs to get done is because we don't have the programs that we had in the 70s and the 80s. No level of government has, is investing that kind of money. I would actually dare to say that as a city, the city of Toronto by itself um, has never invested this kind of money. We have invested on the Housing Now sites on our own about $180,000 a unit on those units by the city between the land and the incentives that we are creating. A few years back, we were creating affordable housing at a bit of $150,000 a unit, but that was investment in affordable housing money. It was all provincial federal money. So I think that the city has clearly said, we need to do something in here, and we are putting our land, we are putting uh, in investments in this. But I think that uh, we can also use other powers that we have, and that's where things like the missing middle come through. And, and, cre and using our zoning tools and using some, some intensification. Um, and for me, uh, I think that this is um, to create options of housing, but it's actually about equity as well. I also feel that when you are restricting uh, uh, you know, so much zoning, so much land to the housing, you're actually telling a lot of people that make a certain kind of income that they're not going to be able to live in those neighborhoods. And so um, if we want to have uh, uh, a city uh, that, that has those mixed uh, income communities, which is not that much different. I, I represent an area that was extremely blue collar, Toronto West End. You know, I remember 30 years ago, everybody had a two or three units in their house. And I, I tell my neighbors and I remind them of that and everybody says yes. Um, and uh, what we saw was a lot of those homes actually being converted into single family homes. And, and so um, we're not talking about actually doing something that has not been done in our city. We're actually just giving options to the people that if they wanna have a laneway suite to have their parents, um, they could have that, that laneway suite. Um, I actually 
John, am I doing okay for time? Okay. I'm actually going to share with you a, a story that, um, that um, it, was, it was one of those moments in politics that you really appreciate. It was when I was doing the laneway housing uh, consultations. Uh, I went to a community meeting and um, somebody comes up to me with her daughter and says, I, I don't speak English. I just came here because my daughter follows you on social media, and I just wanted to come here because I uh, wanted to say thank you. I've never had a politician do something uh, that, this, that will affect me as much as this. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, okay. And she explained to me her daughter had just graduated university, and they could not afford anything. They knew they could not afford anything in the area, but that they would be able to, they could afford to build a laneway housing, uh, a laneway suite for her to have her space and independence in her apartment. And then she laughed and she turned to me, she's like, and if I'm lucky enough, you know, in a few years, we'll switch and I even take care of my grandkids. And, and the, I, I thought that was so special because the power that, it was not about the bricks and mortars, but even the social impacts that this have and the social supports that the, these things have you're building communities, right? That's, that's what it's all about. And the, that, that was, to me, it really touched me. And, and I started looking into this issue of the missing middle more and more because I think that it is giving the opportunity to people to support each other and to live in, in these ways. And it, it is very, very much about, uh, about equity because uh, people can, can have the option of living and should have the option of living um, in all kinds of neighborhoods in our city. And uh, uh, so I think that is an important point that I'd like to, to make in here. Okay, so I'm gonna ask my three co-editors very quickly um, about the following. So part of this change is about, um, is about change, it's a hearts and minds story, right? How do, you, how do you get people to get to yes when there's some kind of intensification in the neighborhood instead of viscerally saying no? So starting with Annabelle at the top of the alphabet. Uh, and I'd like you to all give a very quick answer to this question. What is one thing you would do to change the NIMBY culture in the city? I think one thing I throw back to audiences is just to think about the wealth that has accumulated in the house that you've bought. That wasn't because you were savvy, that you knew exactly where to live, you bought a house to raise a family, and you have benefited obscenely because of global capital. And that wealth can be thought of as something you walk away with, or it can also be thought of something that you recapitalize into your community by diversifying your housing stock and thinking about what that actually means rather than thinking about it as a nest egg for my kids, which is one way to think about it, but it's an interesting thing just to sort of challenge yourself with, to think about that capital and how to reinvest it. Cheryl? Um, I'd like to hold, it, hold it up. I'd like to take it back to kindergarten, first lesson, sharing is caring, right? So this land is our land, share the land, right? Like to think that this is my neighborhood and only people like me deserve to be here and uh, people like me own their housing and renters are gross or anything of that kind of nature of othering and not considering the land is again to be shared, right? We are to share the land, thank you, right? To share the land and, and to share the land means to provide affordable housing options for people who need it. So that's, that's the message. Alex? Um, I guess I would say two things. I mean, f number one is that, well, really these are the same thing. I don't think that the culture of NIMBYism can easily be reformed among the people who are heard at community meetings. You know, the fact is that the planning discussion in Toronto is done piece by piece um, on everything. Um, and that's often seen as a good thing, that, the, that there's such a bottom-up model in the way that we plan. But I think... Um, I think you need to get new voices in, uh, and I think that means changing the model. So number one, you know, change the way in which planning consultations are done to include more people who are not immediate neighbors and to actively solicit the participation as, and this is something Cheryl's done some interesting work with, actively solicit the participation who are not, of people who are not um, retired homeowners with 
you know, an axe to grind. Um, sorry, guys. Um, it's, you know, and I guess the other point I, I'd like to make is that I think we've learned something from the laneway housing um, change in policy, which has been sort of, the impact of that change has been very modest so far, but, you know, what it tried to do and has to some degree succeeded in doing is to just make things happen by right. You know, making, to cut off the conversation by not allowing the conversation to happen. We need our leaders, our political leaders, to simply redefine the terms of the game and just say that, you know, we are open to more people in more places and more different forms of housing and just make that, make the rules allow that to happen rather than allowing everything to be sort of, um, you know, uh, negotiated to death or, de or consulted, uh, killed by consultation. Okay, so I've got, I've got a question for Councillor Bylaw. So um, we have an official plan which you voted on um, which identifies residential neighborhoods as stable, that they are designated as stable spaces in the, in the city and therefore protected from all sorts of change. So um, if you undertake the process that Council is moving towards, do you have to revisit the rhetoric of stability, and does that inform the nimbyism that we have in the city? Yes, and I think that it is time that we have a big conversation around that, um, because that is very much tied with uh, what kind of city we're planning for, what kind of city we're building. Um, but I do think um, that it is one of the key things that we need to understand is what is so scared of people and what are people so tied up to this um, single family home concept? Um, uh, is it um, just change? I think there's a little bit more than that. Um, and I think we have to face those issues head on as we're having this conversation as a city. But yes, we need to have the conversation. Uh, we need to, to challenge what is a stable neighborhood because as Annabelle said, I mean, if there's anything that is happening in the city every single minute, it's change. <laughs> so there's really nothing stable in the neighborhood. Um, and so how do we have that conversation is really important. I think one of the things that we learned in the laneway housing is it's really important to have those conversations starting um, not only at City Hall, but most importantly, actually outside City Hall. Um, and so uh, dialogues like this, having organizations, having our academic institutions, having all kinds of neighborhood groups, having this conversation, I think is really important. And then I really identifying what are you looking for? Um, because people talk about main, main streets all the time and the schools closing all the time, but they never, never associate that with the housing, never. And we have to make, to bring those numbers, we have to make those connections and make people understand. I still have people, I, I go to community meetings and, and the other day I had somebody t telling me how much they appreciated the work that I do on housing, but that, that seven story building that uh, we were having a meeting on, it was really not appropriate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need to make these connections. We need to have these conversations. Is there too much consultation? I don't think there's too much consultation. I think that the consultation is not directed to the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. I think it gets a room of people together and everyone gets to write on the sticky note. But it, that's, that's one thing. But to actually get a group of people together and really solve a problem is a different type of consultation. And I think they're beginning to happen. I do think that, but they take a different muscle group and they take work. Uh, in Vancouver, this amazing piece of zoning took a group of neighbors 10 years to come up with, but it's brilliant. And it was well received and has produced the results that this group of very committed neighbors worked through, right? Yeah, so I'd argue that we actually need more consultation, and I'll s explain why. Because um, we need more consultation because we need to undo a lot of the work that, that we're having to deal with, like the planning institution and the planning regulations as they are now, there's a lot of undoing that needs to be done. And to undo that, you need to consult people and you need to ask them the questions that they need to be asked and the questions that they have not been asked. So, yeah. What are those questions? 
what are those questions? Um, those questions are who belongs in this neighborhood? And um, you make sure they say everybody, <laughs> right? And then uh, you go from there. Like, I, so, so one of the projects that I did um, that I'm most proud of is that my Housing in Focus project. And um, what I learned from that is actually that you ha your, your role as a planner, as a facilitator, is actually to give trust in the people that you're working with. And I think that's something that the pl planning needs to do more of. They need to give more trust in people, and specifically to give more trust in people who are underhoused and people who are looking to support those who are underhoused. Um, when I first had my idea for the Housing in Focus, it was just to allow them to tell their stories. But when I asked them, what do you actually want to do in this project? They said, we want to solve the problem. So I designed a consultation process so they can help to solve the problem. And um, I received an email from one of my community, part my community uh, I guess, partners, you know, connect with community. And um, he showed me a poster for a consultation that's happening in his neighborhood. One, unfortunately, led by the city, and it was come and hear about the project that we're leading in your neighborhood. Learn about the development that we're putting in your neighborhood. It was not, hey, we want to hear from you. Um, what are your concerns? What are your interests? It's just listen to us speak, and then maybe you'll complain a bit, and then just like. So I think that's kind well, of I think that to, to work with. I think that's kind of typical in a way because there's a real disconnect. Um, as I've been coming to see more and more clearly in the last few years, there's a real disconnect between land use policy and everything else. Somehow land use policy is always about how big things are and how far they are away from other things. But land use policy is actually deeply shapes every other aspect of our society, right? And we don't make those connections. And because Toronto, for a variety of reasons, has this weird culture where essentially nothing is permitted, um, you know, unless it's a house. Well, you know, it's, it's a joke, but it's true. I mean, almost no buildings in the city that are not houses get built without some sort of... Um, zoning bylaw amendment or official plan amendment, which is crazy. So, you know, what, what it says on paper is never effectively what is going to get built, unless it's a house. And that is insanely dysfunctional. People at City Hall, for some reason, don't think that is dysfunctional. But I, I think it's a problem because, you know, you have these sort of um, abstract ideals about what the city stands for, but the actual policies we have in place don't support those ideals, um, and then you argue about the details of what it says on paper and what's allowed and whether this should be, you know, a 10-story building or a 12-story building, um, you know, when the zoning says it should be a four-story building, it's this strange sort of legalistic, um, you know, um, confrontational process rather than talking about the stuff that people actually care about. Yeah, and people don't understand it. Don't it. Yeah, uh, why are you? It's only four stories. Oh, but our official plan should say eight stories. No, but the zoning says four stories. Why <laughs> do you want to break the rules, <laughs> yeah. right? Okay. Every meeting. But what I would say is there needs to be more consultation, but on a different thing. And I would say is the vision. We need, as a city, need to invest more on secondary plans. And because people are afraid of lack of infrastructure. They don't understand how the dots connect. They just say, oh, all this construction, but will our drains sustain this? What's the plan for the transportation? So I think that we as a city need to move more and involve more the pu public in creating that vision, connecting that dots to give some certainty to the people that there, there is a plan. There's a plan to respond to this growth that everybody's really scared of. And if this growth is coming into your backyard, we're, this is the way we're going to address that. And that, what I think, needs to be more consultation so we're not doing piecemeal by piecemeal. Every building, spending hours on end uh, discussing, and it's always the same discussions. It's actually, what do we want to have as a neighborhood? Okay, so uh, thank you.